Um, she was the Via um, yes, from UNL in 1980 and the baby from UNL College of Law in 1983. Uh, she served as the Deputy Hall County Attorney from 1983 to 1988 and the Deputy Deputy County Attorney from 1988 to 1997. After some time in our private practice at the firm of Powell & uh, she was appointed as a county court judge of the 5th Judicial District in 2005. Additionally, she is a member of the Supreme Court uh, Commission on Children in the Courts, the Judicial Ethics Committee, and the Executive Committee of um, County, court, or, uh, county Judges Association. And she's going to talk to us about some par the parenting time, and uh, she's also chair of the Parenting Time Standards Subcommittee of the Commission. So. Everyone should have a copy of the guidelines, and what uh, I plan to do today is just go through each of the guidelines, talk about how we came to it, and answer any questions that you might have, or any talk about any suggestions you might have. This project started with the Supreme Court Commission on Children in Court. One of the projects that they wanted to work on was parenting time. So they uh, wanted to put together a subcommittee to study that issue. And that subcommittee was formed trying to use uh, a wide assortment of people. I'm going to go through with you who those people were. We tried to get a diverse group and also a group that represented the across the state. So we had guardian ad litems, we had parents' attorneys, we had judges, we had HHS administrators, we had CASA, and we had foster care removal. And those members were, some of them are here, so feel free, the members that are here, to jump in any time to talk about our process. Ron Alvin, Dick Stafford, Joe Peterson, Chris Hannes, Carolyn Thiel, Barry Young, Judge Heideman, Marcy A. P. Graham, Robert Goodwin, Judge Rowland, Kathy Ewan, and of course I have to thank Vicki Weiss, who was a very big part of the subcommittee. So what we did is this. We decided that before we developed the guidelines that we needed to get some information from what other people were doing and examine some of the research. So Judge Johnson really was instrumental in getting to us what other states are doing. So we got some materials from several states that have tackled this problem. We looked at the state of Georgia. We looked at Los Angeles County in California. And actually one of the best models that's around is from Iowa, who's our neighboring state. They actually have a lot of material on parenting time. They have a model court system that you know, been in development for the last two or three years and one big component of that is visitation. So we looked at those materials and then the uh, Court Improvement Project helped with funding to get us some training and we actually had the people from the Iowa Model Court come over and talk to us and they shared with us their process and they actually have a group of people that uh, a whole like 20 or 25 people that met every week for like over a year to develop their guidelines, so they really, really put a lot of effort into it. We also had Norma Ginther. How many of you uh, saw Norma Ginther? Actually, isn't she great? She was really, uh, gave us a lot of motivation, kind of changed your mind how to think about visitation from the eyes of a child in a common sense, down-to-earth way. So we thank Norma also for her input into our process. Once we had looked at some other things and had that training, we had a series of conferences to try and develop just some general guidelines that people could look at, take back to your own place for your practice, and use them. Not as they're written, but use them as guidelines for what might work best for where you're at. So. We're going to go through them. We're going to talk about them. If there's any questions, I will tell you this. We had a diverse group. We didn't agree on everything. We had some compromises. You'll see that when we go through that maybe they're not exactly what you might think or your neighbor might think. But we tried to come up with a consensus. And we did have a lot of perspectives. So we tried to address the issues that 
everyone had. The first one is that children shall be provided meaningful and safe parenting time from the time they enter care until reunification or until further order of the court. The department is to provide as much parenting time as possible, consistent with the best interests of the child, both in terms of frequency and duration, to provide that opportunity in the least restrictive, most home-like setting appropriate to meet the needs for safety. That's just basically your goals. What you should give from that is that you want meaningful and safe parenting time, that you want as much parenting time, that you want to always consider the best interests of the child, and you want your parenting time to be the least restrictive and the most home-like setting. And we all heard Norma talk about when she was walking past the, the visitation that was going on and she thought it was a psychotic moment. I think we all need to keep that in mind and that's why we specifically put in that it should be the most home-like setting appropriate. During our training we did hear about some places who actually have like a visitation house. The community members actually got together and had a facility that was like a home. So for visitation, the kids and the parents could come together under supervision. They could cook meals together. They could watch a movie together. They could do homework. And it was all in a setting that was more home-like, which of course is conducive to enhancing their skills and also conducive for assessment of their skills. So that home-like setting is really important. And so that's why we put it in with the goals for the first, in the first guideline. The second guideline is basically parenting guidelines herein are minimums. We didn't want anyone to think this is what you need to do, you have to do, you must do, if you don't do this, it's wrong. These are minimums. We want to think you get more than this, but you should get at least this. So don't say you've had it two times a week so you don't get any more. The third thing, third guideline is that parenting times obviously have to be based on the circumstances and needs of each family and uh, also consider the re reason for the removal and that the, if there is a variance which results in less parenting time than is in these guidelines, then that variance must be articulated to all the parties. That means you can't hide the ball, you can't have an opinion about why somebody shouldn't have visitation but be scared to tell them or, you know, sugarcoat it in some way. You need to articulate it to everyone and it has to be factually based, appropriately documented, and approved by the court. So the, the thought is, if you're not going to give the visitation that's set forth as much as possible, you need to be tell the court and you need to be telling them why. Now, you're, when we get to like 15, there are all kinds of variances. So don't think that, I couldn't believe all the variances that people could think of. And it's true because every case is different. Every case is going to have to be streamlined and are, you know, put to what your circumstances are. The fourth guideline just uh, reiterates that if there's a conflict between what's in the best interest of the child and the best interest of the parent, then the best interest of the child has to control. Because sometimes those are competing interests, but the recognition of parenting time is that, uh, as we all know, the, re the juvenile court goal is for the best interest of the child. Five just says what we refer to as parenting time, what we mean by that. And six was really our first, I think the first five were pretty easy to come to a consensus about. Six is really where we've had a lot of discussion and there might be some disagreement in the room about when you should make your first parenting time available. And other states uh, have it, like in Los Angeles, they have, you have to have some sort of contact between the parent and the child like depending on the age of the child, within the first 12 hours. You have to let them have a phone call, you have to have them let them have some sort of visit to tell them what's going on. So we, uh, considering the geographics of our state, we uh, agreed on that it has to be done within the first 48 hours, but no later than 72 hours. How many of you think that happens now? It doesn't? No. 
And when do, when do removals happen? Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon. That's, Friday that's afternoon. just the way it is. I think, especially in school session, they're thinking about, oh, these kids are going home for the weekend, or gosh, if I'm going to do something, I better get it done today because I'm, it's two days. I'm going to be out of the office, and you know, so 48 hours, no later than 72. Unless there's a court order to the contrary, and that basically gives the judges the discretion when you're signing your ex parte order to say no visitation until they appear in court or something. Is Question? You, and you just did what I was going to ask, and that is you used word visitation. And I'm saying, yeah, okay, <laughs> we have, we have, are we, we've got visitation stuck in our mind. It does, and you know, Norma gave that to us, didn't she? And um, I heard one of the judges say yesterday, we're still one of the B states, and I definitely still have that in my head. So please pardon me when I say visitation, it's parenting time. And I always take that as akin to, it used to irritate me when I was, had a younger, a younger child, and people would, I would go out somewhere and they'd say, is your husband babysitting? <laughs> well, he's not babysitting, <laughs> they're his kids. So it's the same sort of thing. Sometimes the words that you use have meaning, and so parenting time, parenting time. And we call it parenting time, and we try to refer to it as parenting time. So pardon me when I say that. Okay, number seven is uh, what should happen at the detention hearing. At the detention hearing, what we wanted to do is reiterate that the court actually needs to be involved in this. And I have to say that I'm not always involved in this. Um, if nobody brings it up, nobody's <coughs> complaining, I, I might say something like, is there any issues we need to address, but we don't specifically talk about parenting time. Now, I think it's made a big difference with our pre-hearing conferences that, that that issue is getting addressed. Probably better than it used to be. Because it used to be if the, the department did it when it could do it, and if nobody was complaining, sometimes it took a little bit longer. Well, if that issue is brought up at that pre-hearing conference, then that issue should not be the issue that it is. But the courts should, at each detention hearing, at the first detention hearing, specifically ask the parties if a parenting time is in place. And we also reiterated with that one that the parenting time plan that's developed stays in place until adjudication, until family circumstances change, and that it's only to be limited if it's necessary for the child's best interest. Basically, we laid out some of the reasons that it might be. Number eight was another contentious discussion, if uh, some of you remember, um, that are in here from the committee. In developing the parenting time plan, business will be supervised until, from removal until adjudication or further order of the court, unless specific parenting time, as outlined in paragraph nine, recommends otherwise. So we had a huge discussion. You start out with the presumption of supervision, you start out with the presumption of unsupervised. And uh, there's, there's people that go both ways, there's uh, research that goes both ways. The reason we came down with supervised is uh, because there was a lot of, I think the guardian of Leibniz kept reminding us that the reason for the removal from the child was a safety issue. So we should start out with supervised. The compromise that we did was in nine, we said that within 45 days following the removal from the child, if the child is still in care, a more case-specific parenting time needs to be developed. And the reason we did that is this. During that specific parenting time plan, it's my understanding from the input that we had from the department, they do a safety assessment. So if their safety assessment uh, does not show the need for supervised visitation, then it can move in to unsupervised. So eight specifically says, unless the case-specific parenting time is outlined in nine, recommends otherwise. So you get the opportunity to have unsupervised. We don't want you to think you're going to have supervised from the day until you have duty from the removal until adjudication. 
Also in A, we did put in, we added this in, I think, uh, after maybe almost to the end of our process because we have had situations where non-custodial parents ended up having supervised parenting time. I'm going to try and change, I guess I was just saying visitation again. Um, should have, we're in enough. Some non-custodial parents, after removed from a child, were having supervised parenting time. And so to recognize that we don't think that that's probably appropriate, we did put in that pre-existing visitation plans. We even made the mistake there. We should have put parenting time plans. Pre-existing plans with non-custodial parents will be maintained. So if you have a non-custodial parent, non-offending non-custodial parent, there's no reason that their pre-existing plan that was entered by the district court or some other court should not be maintained. So, and then nine is just a recognition of that. Within 45 days, we want a more specific plan. You can start out with a generalized plan, which I think is all you can do at the beginning, because you don't have enough information. But after, within 45 days, and we had some discussion about that, because there was a lot of people who wanted that to happen within 30 days. But that was kind of a, a compromise with the realities of, um, work and so forth, that 45 days is probably more realistic. Sure. Um, if there's no pre-existing uh, uh, planting time plans with a non-custodial parent, would that would we presume assume that the non-custodial parent gets supervised? I would not. I would presume unsupervised. Anybody disagree with that? What was the question? The question was, if you don't have a pre-existing visitation plan that's been set forth like by a court, and that happens a lot, would you presume that you would have supervised visitation with a non-offending, non-custodial parent? And my thought is no. I think that parent should still receive. I think you'd have to look at how much uh, parenting time he had had in the past, how he had exercised it. You, you might want to you gather information about whether there were problems, but I don't think you start off with the presumption of supervised for that. Does anybody disagree with that? That's how the department is. Is it? Is that your policy? I don't work for the department, but Casey can talk to that. Yeah, that's what we would listen to. That's what you would do. You would start off that way. Well, there's a policy. Don't worry, I'll say the guideline number 10 is basically an acknowledgement that parenting time plans need to have the input from everyone. They shouldn't be just a person sitting in the office and looking at the guidelines and saying, okay, let's plug this in, plug that in. They should be unique to the child. And we tried to think of just about everyone that we could get input from, the child, the guardian ad litem, the CASA worker, foster parents, the county attorney, and any other agency or individual involved with the parenting time plan. And also an acknowledgement that the best place to do these is, where possible, the parenting time plan should be developed in a family conference with as many as the participants present as possible. So that's the, that's the optimum. We understand that that won't always happen, but if you can make that happen, that's the best way to do it. We also wanted to put in an acknowledgement that sometimes there are persons other than family members that a child might have a significant attachment to, and we wanted to acknowledge them in this goal, that you should try to include everyone that ha might have the best interest of this child in mind. We also said family members include non-custodial parents. They need to be involved. Sometimes they're not. Other persons <laughs> demonstrating significant attachments. And also we talked about having, it's in here somewhere, about uh, a provider who has assessed the child. So if you have some professional who has had some contact with this child and might have done some professional assessment of the child, then that person is an obvious person that should be consulted when you're developing your parenting time plan. And we also wanted to reiterate in there that we should consider all of those folks who have attachments to children uh, to facilitate parenting time. So don't forget about 
A non-custodial parent, if the relationship is such, might be a person to supervise visitation with the offending parent. They obviously know each other. You know, so don't just assume that, that it has to be someone outside of the family or someone that's uh, the, the grandmother or uh, something like that. You can use everyone that you can think of. Okay, 11 is just basically a um, acknowledgement that your parenting time needs to be flexible. And the, that is, the reason we put that in there is to, so that people understand when you're developing a parenting plan, you need to acknowledge that it needs to be flexible. If you don't, if there's any deviation from it, you're going to get people complaining about it. So what we did is we put in that the parenting time needs to be flexible, but we also added the last phrase, and that is any aggrieved party may request a hearing before the court. So you could, so that if a person sees the flexibility in the parenting time plan, but also sees that they have the right to request a hearing before the court, then that makes it easier for them to understand when something gets changed. When the rules get changed, they know that they have the ability, which they've always had. Some of these are just common sense things that we try to put together in one place so that everyone would have an idea of what their rights are. 12 is the one thing we learned from, not one thing, one of the many things we learned from Norma Ginther, and that is that parenting time should not be used as a threat or a form of discipline to the child or to control or punish the parent. And I will say that I think that that still happens. We have, and maybe, maybe not, but I see very often reports that say, mom didn't show up two times and so we're not scheduling anymore. And maybe that's because that's in the best interest of the child, but maybe that's because we're gonna punish mom. So you have to dig a little deeper. Comment? Well, <coughs> excuse me, on that particular issue, we're still struggling with it out in our class, with regard to drug and alcohol use by the parent and testing, it's pretty standard, standard that we'll tell the case we're going to make sure she's tested before we visit. And if she's high or if she's under the influence, the visit's not going to happen. Norma seemed to think right. that was a bad idea. She did. She told us that too, and this was her response. These kids have probably been around this. And unless it's an actual physical threat to the child, in which, it, I mean, if they, if they act in such a way that it's a physical threat to the child, call the police. That's, that's inappropriate. But it doesn't, she told us that too. And I guess, is that open for discussion? What do people think? I mean, it depends on the level. I think, you know, if you got somebody that's falling down drunk, that might be one thing. But if they're a little under the influence, how many times have you had people come to court? I don't even know they're, you know, they're pretty hammered until mm -hmm. the deputy who's sitting closer to him says, this guy needs to be tested and he'll test like, over like one out when you're like, are you kidding me? So some people maintain because of their history of usage a pretty good, you know, way to maintain that that level. So how many of us have parented that? Well, you and everybody that ever has, you know, went out and had a cocktail or something in a home. You know, somebody was meeting you at your door with the breath testing and saying, you can't come in. I mean, we would yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I, mean, I guess, I think what Norma tried to reiterate to us is you have to look at how they're at. You know? So what do you think? Well, it, it obviously depends on the circumstance, but my fear is uh, if the case was old and weak, Parent, this is when mom is an alcoholic and we want her to smoke, right? And there are classes available, she's not enrolling, she comes uh, uh, drunk all the time. My fear is what is enabling her for an hour and a half. And it's not to punish, but to say, you can't visit until you take the time to get some of the work. I think behavior is really the focus, how the parent is behaving, not just the fact that they tested, it's how they're acting. But the reason for the reason for these initial visits is the reason for the initial visits is for the child, the best interest of the child. Right. These children need to see their parents 
because of the emotional damage that's being done to the child. You know, even if it's a 10 minute visit and the, the adult is, is hammered, if the child, I mean, that, that child's used to seeing that. Exactly. What they're not used to is exactly. not seeing their parents, period, and being in a strange home. You do more psychological damage to that child by, by basically keeping the parent away. Yeah. I guess I'm not I talking can't, about initial, because when we're talking, it sounds like we're going from initial to ongoing uh, parenting time before the teen getting together to plan the parenting times. I guess I'm, I'm looking further down the case. Initially, I do agree. Uh, within 48, 24, 48 hours, that makes sense. You can't ask a parent to do everything that you want the parent to do uh, to visit the kids. You're right. I, I would have talked about that. But we're talking about, I thought we were talking about down the line. Go so back to if the best interests of the child and the best interests of the parent are in conflict, the best interests of the child should control. So, I mean, not everybody's going to have to. That differently. Casey, um, I think you know that it's it's concerning to have those visits when they're under the influence. But the other thing is, if they're not working the case plan, that's part of it. But they're still having those visits. So when you're at your team meeting, then you're saying, you know what, mom, you've made all your visits, but you know you haven't decided to, to so clean up your act. To so you is, are you allowing the parents to get visits now when they are? Uh, yes. You are. Yes. Okay. We're, well, we're start. We're trying to start implements implementing some of these things. I think that's a really huge change because that has been kind of a. Yeah. You don't get any visits. You didn't show up, so I'm not scheduling another visit. And I think for I think for children that are old enough, they they need to see that their parents are still okay. I've actually had children that, that have, because I supervise some of the visits, that have, have come to me and visited and said, Dad's had too much to drink, I think we need to go. Which I think says to the kid, you know, they have some power. They have some power. Did you have a comment? I also think that, I think uh, Norma addressed this a little bit, is that we tend to think that if we take those visits away, that's going to motivate the parents to do what they need to do, and in reality, that sends them deeper into their addiction, and if they're not building that bond and continuing that bond, then they're going stronger, possibly in the other way, instead of that we're thinking, well, the more we hold that back, the more they're gonna reach out for it, but I think that's opposite of what really happens. And at some point, like, the way I think about it, everybody will have their own way of doing this, but I don't think you should punish if they don't show up but at some point, you do, if, if something the parent is doing or not doing is harming the child and you believe it's not in the best interest of the child, then that's the point. You have to think about what the child needs. You don't want to think about, dang that mom, I don't, that makes me mad, we spent all this time and money, and you know, you have to think about the truth from the child's perspective. Go ahead. Addressing just the The individuals that I've seen there are very narcissistic. You know, it's all about them. At that point in time, they need to like themselves. But, but we need to remember we're not giving them testing. We're giving them parenting time. And I've seen them in short, when they're capable of functioning. I've seen them in short, the same people, when they're very capable. You know, there's, there, there's a wide swing. And I think the kids see this. I, my concern with children, I see children who don't have this Those kids are kids that are lost. They really, truly are. You find, and you know, you, you, you can't really put a diagnosis on them and show up and go to screw with them. But if you go back to the kids that have had the disorder back in the time they were little, I'm not going to be able to tell you how to go with it. I'm not going to be able to tell you how to go with it. We need to make sure that we address that. We need to see that these kids have got to be found attached to somebody. It doesn't matter who. It just 
this need to be established. Thank you. Anyone else before we move on from that one? About the incarcerated parents. You know, I don't know though. Did we discuss that? We did. And what what did we talk about? We talked about it. kids who are not in the system visit incarcerated parents. So kids who are in the system can visit incarcerated parents. It's traumatic, but it's less traumatic than they imagine. They imagine dungeons. They imagine yeah. all kinds of terrible things. They need to see that their parents get fed, that they can communicate. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, uh, kids need to visit. <clears throat> and I suppose you'll have to. Obviously, it would. Um, whoever, wherever they are, obviously that would have missing hours and that sort of thing. So, yeah, but I, I agree with that. Sometimes that's normal for those kids too. They, even before they were born, mom took them to see dad in prison. So we think it's so traumatic that really they know every other weekend they go see dad. Well, it's kind of like the same way with under the influence of trauma and stuff. Yeah. Do you have a comment? Are we able to say that was a parent or child because the child got nightmares and that is that a sufficient reason? How do you do that part? I suppose that it depends on um, each case, but I think you have to, whoever the case management worker is, has to assess the situation based on input from everyone. Professionals, the foster parents, anyone that's working with them. You know, I what did was it Norma who said it's you were if they didn't have nightmares and stuff when you came back? So I think how many of us have heard, you hear this in divorce cases, that, oh, they always act up when they come back. Well, if we accept that's, that that's normal, um, then you know maybe we can move forward with that. So I don't really know. I, the other reason I'm asking will be as a parent attorney oftentimes, I'm going to ask you for your reason. Your specific impact. I'm going to make it come up with something. And that, I, that's legitimate. And, but I think uh, you know, <coughs> that's a legitimate question for whoever's making that decision. You know, and if somebody says, this is what I want, the question has to be asked why, and it has to be factually driven. It can't be because. You know, it has to be factually driven, and it has to be the judge would have to determine that that's a legitimate reason to deviate from the parenting plan. So. And in our county, that would mean we'll be about two weeks before we get a hearing to decide it's whether tough. that's legit. I agree with that. And I that's think, optimistic. I think that's true. And I think when we say anyone can request a court hearing, that we understand that there are many places where Time will go by before that gets addressed by a judge, and then they might take it under advisement and still will be it'll still be a few more days. So, you know, that's the only thing we can do. One of the purposes for people like Norma going out and talking and trying to change our mindset is to put this uh, kind of as one of the main focuses that you have. Don't forget about visitation when you're doing everything else because it's really an important part. And so all we can do is try to develop some best practices that we can try to implement. Okay, 13. Each party involved in the parenting time plan, including the custodial or non-custodial parent or parents, the department, individuals, or agencies participating in the parenting time plan are responsible for complying. That is our acknowledgement that it does not fall on one person. Every single person that's involved in that with that child and is aware of this parenting time plan has the responsibility to make sure that it's complied with. So you can't put it all off on the caseworker, you can't put it all off on mom or dad. Yeah, everyone that's involved in this has a responsibility to comply with this. And non-custodial parents is a big part of that. They need to be involved, they need to be on board. So if you can get them involved, that's the best thing. 14 obviously was a uh, lots of discussion about what numbers we should put in <clears throat> because numbers everybody wants to look at something and say oh this is what we need this is what we're supposed to do it's really not what that's intended for and again we uh, wanted to highlight that these are minimum numbers 
but we wanted to put a number in because I think that's what people expect. And we also wanted to put something, I think we're there higher than what we're getting right now, so we wanted people to have something to, we need to be doing this. So, age of birth to 18 month, five times a week, daily visits are optimal. Is that happening? Some discussion that we had during our group says in some places it is. So I uh, applaud those, those, those places, because I don't think that happens everywhere. But think about a baby. And the other thing that is in here more than once is duration can be different. If somebody mentioned you can see somebody for 10 minutes or something, you need to see them, see that they're okay. Um, but you know, you don't have to have an all day visit. You can have different durations. But babies need to see their moms, particularly, and their dads. So we said five times a week, daily visits are optimal. And then, we had a hard time too, not a hard time, but we had some discussion about where we should break down these ages. So uh, this is what we came up with after a lot of discussion. We tried to think about when children kind of move into the next phase. So the next phase after that was 18 months to three years, and that's four times a week. And then three to eight years was three times a week, preferably on non-consecutive days, because we didn't want to, you want to have that consistent, looking forward to happening, not just get it out of the way for three days in a row and then I don't have to do anything for four days, so. Eight to 14 years was two times a week. 14 to 19 years was two times a week. We also, after that, wanted to reiterate that the family should have additional contacts separate from this. And those contacts can include telephone contacts, school activities, Obviously, these parents should be able to go to a public place and watch their child participate in whatever it is that they're participating in. <coughs> Doctor's appointments and other family functions. And we try to just make a general statement about how long they should be because we didn't put that, we didn't put that in. We just put the times. Visits should be long enough to promote parent-child attachment. The lengths of the visit should gradually increase as the parents show that they're able to respond in consistent and nurturing ways to the child and attend to the child's needs. So even if you're having lots of visitation at first, maybe it's shorter, but as the, the parent <coughs> demonstrates that, that they can do things, then you make it longer. Initially limiting visits to one or two hours may allow the parent to experience small successes without becoming overwhelmed. And as the family approaches reunification, unsupervised, all day, overnight, and weekend visits should be completed. So it's progressive. You don't want to come in and go, oh, you're doing really well. I think in three weeks we're going to let this child go home and then bombard it. Try to get to those unsupervised as quickly as you can. Try to get to those all days as quickly as you can. And then to the overnights and the weekends. 15, this is all the variances. <laughs> the guidelines for minimum hours for parenting provided in paragraph 14 shall apply in every case unless, based upon the circumstances of each case, a variation is warranted. In considering whether to vary from the guidelines, consideration should be given to any circumstances which might exist, including but not limited to the following. <coughs> Safety is first. Um, I, I guess I want to clarify something. So, paragraph three says that if there's a variance yep. that decreases the parenting time, that has to be approved by the right. Is that right? So yes. essentially the burden is on the department or whoever the comment is of having less parenting time, get a hearing schedule, and that until that happens, the parenting time will continue according to the minimum. Well, we had some discussion about that. And here's your out, if you're, if, if, if parenting time, it needs to be flexible so that we put that in a separate paragraph that if you're going to decrease it, no, you don't have to go to the court and get a court order because there's some flexibility built in. There is, if that's in um, where they could request a court order. If you decrease it below the minimum, if you decrease it below the minimum, then it has to be factually based, documented, and presented to the court. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you have to go to court first, but you're going to get called on it. You are going to in your jurisdiction? You are going to get called on it. Yes. And you should get called on it. So factually based, articulated, and, uh, and everyone has the right to request a court hearing. So if you, as a caseworker, decrease it below the minimum guidelines, the parenting plan, plan that you should develop should have that um, place in it that says anyone who's aggrieved by it can request a court hearing. So if you do something, any, ever, all the participants you know they can request a court hearing, and the next time you come before the judge, you're going to be asked to say, how come you didn't do this? You should be based on safety. Right. That's the first one we put down because comment. I guess the Chumpa's grandparents will be able to get a court in the I didn't know what you said. Something about grandparents. Yeah, there's this conflict that the grandparents can now get hearing on these issues. I don't know. We didn't discuss that. As so, part of the formulation yeah. of preparing a Yeah. You know what? We did say that. You're right. We did say any party agreed by the. Yeah, and they would be a part of the Yeah. So I don't care what you got. That's what's not going they went, and you know what? I think what would happen is they would visit with the guardian of Biden. If the guardian of Biden thought it was the best interest for the child, for that visiting, visitation to take place with those folks, then they could get it. Yeah, I think so. Right. You make a good point. But, you know, we didn't, we didn't cover that. Comment? Number 14, why are we giving children less time with their parents just because they get older? Um, because the, the older they get, this is the thought, and you may or may not agree with it. And again, these are minimums, which doesn't mean you can't get more. Uh, these are just minimums. Um, schedules, school activities, that sort of thing. Um, we wanted to make sure, and, and again, before this, we talked about context, kind of, you can still have your parents going to school functions and that sort of thing, in addition to your minimum times. Um, but the older you get, and teenagers, you know? My son is like, how is school good? That's our conversation until he, you know, comes out and says, I'm hungry. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, yeah, and that's the way you draw about it. Did you tell me that the kids at this time we maintain the relationship? I mean, we want to have more of this that they would understand the time he's facing, and they would uh, um, be able to maintain the relationship over that time. Much better as they got older. Yes, we will catch you. Right. So, you have to teach me Yes, so it's kind of a recognition of reality for that. Okay. So, 15 has all the variances. We put them down in one place because it's something you need to be thinking about. If it's not going to happen, um, it's really a... Uh, the reason we did that is because we understand that things have to be flexible and when you're talking to the court, you're probably going to be wanting to refer to one of these things, which have been recognized as a reason for variance. But again, these are guidelines. Everybody has to take what they're what they think is best out of them and do with them what you may. Sixteen is a recognition regarding siblings, which I think our training this week has really emphasized that sibling contact is so important. And uh, did anyone hear the foster kids talk? I think that's very important to them. That's you know that's the person who probably knows where they're coming from, has been their ally, has been their protector. You talk about the parentified child. These siblings really need to have contact. So we put in here a recognition that the relationship between siblings is an important part. Preference should always be for siblings to be placed together. And if they're not placed together, that the parenting time plan shall make specific provisions for contact between siblings. 
unless clear and articulated reasons explain why there should be no contact. So you have to put in your plan sibling contact. If you don't, you're going to be asked why not, and you need to be prepared with clear and articulated reasons explaining why you failed to do that. And I think it's easy not to do that sometimes because it's because of time and distance, it's easy to not include that. But that has to be in your parenting plan. Okay, and then we also wanted to make an acknowledgement that we don't, uh, that you can have parenting time with one child, with both children. So we put in the phrase that some parenting time as a complete family unit is preferred some time spent with various parts of the family unit and um, provided, however, that the duration, length, or quality of parenting time for one child or parent should not be sacrificed on account of another child or parent. So we tried to just make some recognitions of the importance of the sibling relationship and contact. But also, you know, what we don't want people to do is say, we must do this, we must have all the siblings together at one time. <coughs> And so, oh, that sibling can't come, we're canceling. Don't do that. You can have parenting time with this person, you can have parenting time with this person, you can have parenting time with this group. So, 17, which is our last one, is a recognition that visitation parenting time has to be progressive, okay? You have to have more and more and more until you're ready to go home. And here's the recognition of that. In any case where reunification is still the permanency objective and supervised <coughs> visitation is still required six months following the removal from the child, clear articulated reasons should be shown or shall be shown at every review hearing, telling the court why there is the necessity of supervised visitation or in the alternative, <coughs> why unification is still the permanency objective. And that's a recognition that we don't want part-time parents. It's pretty easy to get up to three or four times a week and you, it's pretty, <coughs> you know, I'm seeing my kids, it's fun, but you don't have to take the responsibility for the rest of it. So if you're still having supervised visits six months out, the court needs to know why the permanency objective is still reunification. Because by six months out, you should be progressing. And there are going to be those cases that are the exception, but then you need to be coming into court. The judges, when they see those case plans, the parenting time plans, if at their six months review they're still supervised, the questions need to be asked. And it's a recognition that perhaps it's time to start early on changing that permanency plan. Because if at six months out you're still having supervised visits, then the writing might be on the Any comments? It's the relationship between the child and the current caregiver. What were we thinking? We obviously, somebody discussed that. We have too many members here. That could be. It could be. And maybe we were thinking of if they had. Anyone else here from What were we thinking relationships that might be And what we were doing is we were just brainstorming about the reasons we could think of that might be legitimate for having a Do you make a 16 year old who doesn't want to go? But that's not what I Well, I guess I, I think maybe the concern is, is that 
somebody's going to come in and say, well, you know, they're bonding so well with these foster parents, and that this is interfering, you know, with that time, and the time of the foster parent. Somebody, I mean, I think that phrase, that sentence leaves that wide open for that type of justification to be made. I would always like to interpret that way, so. Okay, anything else? Mr. Stafford. Uh, the uh, commission approved this, you know what's the purpose of this school as far as the wish shine? I don't know that. I think what they were going to do is the commission approved it. I don't think that there's going to be any movement for it to become a court rule. I think what they're going to do is post it on the, a website, maybe through, through the Eyes of a Child, as a best practice and model. So it's like a guideline. It's not, I don't think there's any movement to make it more than that. Um, some of the things that come out of the commission do go on to that phase where they become court rules, but the, I, this is, I don't think there's a plan for that. I think it's just guidelines. Kind of uh, something that you should think about. Because I'm, I'm still going back to the incarcerated parent. Okay. Mm. I mean, I filed motions to add parenting time with the incarcerated parents, and the response is, well, we'll send in pictures. Well, How do you get the word out if it's not in here, or does this need to be amended that we it's about the child seeing the parent, not the parent seeing the child? Are you All your judges should be here. Well, that particular one in prison, and see that, I've dealt with that issue before. You can try to leave the location and they just said that it's too much stress on the child. Linda, if you if if he can convince his judge, if he can convince his judge to put it in, then he doesn't have to care what what somebody else thinks. And if anyone wants to see what a local area did in the state for the Grand Island presentation, they took a lot of the, the step six that we looked at. Thank you. Thank you.